Hi class, this is your instructor Megan, and this week you're doing a couple different things for your Transmedia Narrative project. So I want to, in this video, talk about what those things are. And then further down in this week's Blackboard page, I have a video on how to sketch wireframes, which is one thing you're gonna do this week, and also how to conduct a heuristic evaluation, which is another thing you're gonna do this week. But just to give you kind of a perspective on what those things are and why we're doing them just generally, I want to talk to you about what you're doing this week. And at the end of this short video, I'll go over exactly what you need to do for homework. So I wanna talk about alternatives because last week you, uh, develop some user requirements. So you already know what your story is going to be. You already have seen some uh, similar stories and developed some requirements. And so the next step in our iterative design process that you looked at, you looked at when you read about interaction design is alternatives. And alternatives explore different experiences. It really is just alternatives, alternative ways of creating the thing you want to make. So you're looking at different experiences. Now, the thing about alternatives is you're basically making different options for your design. So you're kind of saying it could be designed this way, it could be designed this way, or it could be designed this way. And each of those alternative designs captures a different kind of user experience. So it's not just colors or placing boxes in a different order. Sometimes I'll see alternatives where it's really the same design three or four times, but the colors are different and that's really not right. That's not how you should develop alternatives. So I'm gonna look at an example. And in this case, I'm gonna look at the example of teaching programming. If your goal is to teach programming and your requirements are things like it should be self-paced, there should be a course overview so people understand what the course is about. People need profiles so they can log in and keep up with the instruction. There should be some way of helping people understand what lessons they've completed. What that might that look like? Well, if we look at Code Academy, which is a great website for learning different programming languages, you can see that they set it up so that there's sort of tracks. So there's an HTML and CSS track, a jQuery track, a JavaScript track. And you can see up here that I have a profile. So I log in and I start a track. And then for the track, as I go through, I earn badges. So you can see that I did the PHP track and every time I got through kind of like a chapter, I earned a badge to show my completion of that PHP track. And the individual lessons look like this. So as I'm going through that PHP track, I see screens like this where on the left I have instructions and I learn about code and on the right I actually try it out and you can see the save and submit code. I click that to see if what I wrote was correct. But that's not the only way to teach someone programming. If we go back to our user requirements, it needs to teach people programming, needs to be self-paced, have a course overview, feature profiles, lesson completion, tracking, etc. Another way to do it is the Skillshare approach. So Skillshare doesn't use the same design as Code Academy, even though they're doing the same thing. If you want to learn programming with Skillshare, it's set up a lot differently. So with Skillshare, instead of there being tracks, there's actually completely different uh, sort of schools, right? I, I go to Skillshare, I type in programming, and I get all of the different courses that have been made by different people that are happening that I can be a part of. And so you can see here, I've identified the programming the iPhone apps, become an iPhone developer class. And I have a profile, I've enrolled in this class. You can see I have lessons over here on the left, so instead of badges, I have this list of lessons. And then on the right, I have videos and instructions. So instead of seeing something like this, where I type in the code and see if it works, uh, based on instructions in text on the left, now I have videos that I'm following. And to see if I'm right, I turn my work into an instructor who looks at it. Of course, another approach is the Coursera approach. So Coursera is a uh, sort of platform for online education where you don't have to be a university student to take the classes. And so it's similar to Skillshare in that I'll go to Coursera and I'll sort of type into the search bar programming. And here you can see I've identified a course. This one is offered by Stanford. Not all of the Coursera courses are offered by Stanford and it's Computer Science 101. And you can see that I have a profile, a profile again up here on the right, but now it's a lot different. Whereas with Code Academy, I had badges I had to earn by completing lessons that were text and then I filled in kind of assignments. 
Instead of Skillshare, where there's a list of lessons that are presented in videos and you turn work into the instructor, here I have all kinds of things. I have lectures, exercises, discussion forums, course how-tos, lecture documents, all these wikis and things over on the left, and there's not a step-by-step -step, do this, 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 this presented to me right away. Um, but when I get into the course, you can see that there is actually a list of different things I have to do. Now, some of these are videos, some of them are assignments. It's more of a mix between Code Academy and Skillshare. So you can see that all three of these designs help people learn programming. And all three of them meet the user requirements, but they're a lot different from each other. Skillshare and Coursera don't have this. But Code Academy doesn't have an instructor. So they're using different approaches to create the same kind of experience to help people reach the same goal. And that's what you're going to do in your alternatives. Your, your Each person on your team is going to come up with their own way of doing it, their own way of making the story into media that people can interact with. The next thing you're going to do is prototype and you're actually going to do prototyping you're going to turn your alternatives into prototypes next week but i want you to see kind of why you're drawing the alternatives out because in this class for the alternatives you're going to sketch them out on paper and the beauty of that is that next week you can take those same sketches or maybe you need to clean them up a little depends on you know how well things go this week and you can actually turn them into pr prototypes and so prototypes are just one manifestation of a design. They're kind of like a fixed form of what you're making. It's a way of showing to potential users what you want to make. And the prototypes enable interactions around a limited set of content. So it's a way of taking what you want to make and sort of paring it down to the most basic elements and putting it in front of people. There's different what we call fidelities for prototypes. Low fidelity prototypes are sketches. They're made quickly. You don't need any digital skills to make them. You can just sit and sketch them out. High fidelity prototypes are functioning software. So these you make later. The first time you put your design in front of people, you want to use those sketches because you don't want to go through, you know, hiring a software developer and creating a high fidelity prototype only to find out that the users hate your approach. And you create these prototypes uh, to sort of communicate your ideas with your other team members, but also to show them to users and stakeholders and explore whether or not that design is right for your project to help your users meet their goals. So every prototype that you make should be put in front of users and experts. So what you're gonna do this week is you're going to design alternatives. So each person on your team is going to sketch out what they think the story should look like. Does it have websites? If so, what do they look like? Do you have Twitter pages? If so, what do they look like? Do you have uh, flyers that you hand out? If so, what do they look like? And what you're gonna do this week is you're gonna decide among the, your to you know with your partner whose alternative was better and then you're going to show that alternative to users next week so in your alternatives this week and again you're going to turn those alternatives into prototypes next week you want to kind of explore the design and functionality and sort of figure out what the user experience is. One thing that I do want to encourage all of you to do is use real content. Don't just put squiggly lines. Here's an example of an alternative that has been turned into a prototype. It's a sketch that has been turned into uh, sort of something that users can touch and feel and hold and see how it works. Uh, this is what we call a paper prototype because it's on paper and that's what you're gonna do, use next week. And you can see that they just sketched out what the different parts of this design look like. This prototype example is for a personal navigator that people could use in a museum and it would actually be a fold out screen. So it'd be like a piece of vinyl with a screen on it. So it has buttons and it's interactive. You can see they've just sketched what all the different pages look like and they've used real content. So when they open it, it says map, it says queue, it has a real map. The queue has real content in it. The buttons actually say things. So that's what you're gonna do this week is draw this out and that's gonna be your alternative. So again, individually, you're going to create those alternatives, but the first step is actually to create a storyboard. And this is just a tool to help you create your alternative. So it's going to look like this. And this is not a complete one, but this is one that I put together as an example. And you can see that I'm just taking the different 
steps of my story, scene one, scene two, scene three, and I'm writing out how the user will experience it. So how does the user enter the story? In this case, there's a Facebook profile and the Facebook profile starts posting recruitment flyers on other people's walls. So the entryway is these flyers that are pasted on, posted on Facebook. The flyers link to a recruitment site. A pop-up on that site gets visitors to go to another site. So you can see that I'm taking the story, which is based on kind of the characters and the action, and I'm connecting each aspect of the story to something the user will see or do. So I'm connecting it to the actual media that will be used in this story. And that's gonna help me because that's going to help me determine what I need to draw in my alternative. So from this, I can see just within the first few steps that I need a flyer to put on Facebook, I need a recruitment website, and I need a pop-up. So that's three things I'm going to have to draw. So think of the storyboard as a tool to translate your story into tangible pieces of media that you're then going to draw in your alternative. And your alter alternative in this case is going to be a wireframe in the form of sketched representations of what you're going to make. So if you're going to make a flyer, sketch out what the flyer looks like. If you're going to make a website, sketch out what the different pages of the website look like. Now, I want to emphasize here that it's really important that you work individually. There's no reason that you need to get with your partner on this project until the very end of the week. You can sit down and create your storyboard right now and then draw your wireframes based on that storyboard right after that. There's no reason for you to discuss any of this with your partner until you've actually made those things. It's really important that you work individually because you want your alternative to be different from theirs. You wanna have more options. You're going for variety here. So each of you should do this on your own so that you have two different options for how your story actually looks to users. And you'll have two different storyboards and two different wireframes. And at the end of the week, you're going to choose one of those. Now, how are you going to choose? You're going to trade your storyboard and wireframes with your partner. And you're going to conduct what's called a heuristic evaluation of your partner's alternatives. So at the very end of the week, you will need to get with your partner and trade your materials. Your heuristic evaluation is gonna look something like this, and I discuss heuristic evaluations in another video on the Blackboard page for this week. And all of this is to prepare for next week. So at the end of this week, each person in your team has a storyboard, alternatives, and a heuristic report, and you've decided which alternative you want to use. And next week, you're going to use the alternative that you both thought was better, or you can mix and match if you like parts of one person's design, but you like other parts of another person's design, you can combine them into a new design and you're going to test that with users. So next week, you're going to take your alternatives, you're going to turn them into prototypes and show them to users to understand if users can figure out how your story works.